because there is no organization today that can do it without a digital strategy. This is not about IT. That era is gone. This is not about automation. It is literally about changing the organization and preparing it for the future. We are in a different era. And that's what I want to share with you and how to lead in this era, what is cybersecurity? You heard a lot of people in many conferences, you will hear people equating information technology with cybersecurity. I can't do cybersecurity because it's technology, it is computer science. But let me tell you, cybersecurity is neither computer science nor technology. And that's one of the things that I'm gonna to explain to you today. So four topics that I'm gonna cover. First, why do we need to think differently? Because you need to know the why. Because if you, until you start believing in the why, and you know why, you won't be inspired to do it. You must believe in that why. The second thing is, I have to explain cybersecurity to you in a way I'm hoping nobody else ever has. Mainly because this is original thinking. I actually am a doctor of science degree holder in the field of cybersecurity. There aren't too many people like that. And you will find that in too many academic programs, they've got some PhD in mathematics or some PhD in physics or some PhD in something else running a cybersecurity program. Folks, it doesn't work. Cybersecurity is neither mathematics, nor engineering, nor computer science. And today, hopefully, that's one of the things. So my, my message to you will be, embrace cybersecurity leadership, and you will be able to lead in that fourth revolution. The third most important thing, we talked all about the people and the leadership. Cybersecurity is all about people. Because the human mind is an unbelievable fountain of innovation. Machines are not innovating. You will see that also. And then, of course, the fourth most important thing, leadership today is not about power. It is not about authority. It is not about what position you hold. It is about the knowledge that you have and the knowledge that you're willing to share with others to empower them to do what they want to do. That is what leadership is. 
My knowledge in my head is completely useless. Knowledge in your head is completely useless. Its power is only when I share it and it empowers somebody else to do something great. That's what leadership is. And so that's what I'm going to cover. So here's the story. You have heard this scenario, information technology. Well, where did it start? It started in the finance department, the accounting department, the HR department. We had to do payroll. We had to do word processing. We had to do email. So technology adoption was mostly about automation. Once upon a time, that's where my career also started. I was in a medical school, and I was transferring that medical school to the digital age, building their first ever network in the state of Texas. Later on, I went to the Calvert Cliffs nuclear power plant in Maryland. Once again, I transformed that nuclear power plant from a paper-based environment where nobody could find anything to a digital environment where you could search any record out there. It wasn't about the network. It was about driving that mission of the nuclear power company forward. I was never about technology. My bachelor's degree is in economics. My master's degree is in political science. At the time I started doing cybersecurity, there was no school that was doing cybersecurity. And that is why I never had a doctoral degree for 30 years. It was only in 2013 that I finally graduated with a doctor of science and cybersecurity because in 2010 is when the program started. So guess what, folks? That's another opportunity. When I graduated in 2013, I was probably the 11th person in the world with a Doctor of Science in Cybersecurity. When I started network engineering, I was probably one of the first in the world. This was in 1984, 1986. Nobody was doing network engineering. When I had to meet anybody, they asked me, what do I do? I said, I'm a network engineer, and I had to explain what that is. And they said, oh, so you have a computer science degree. I said, no, I don't. Most computer scientists wouldn't know how to do what I do. So, but what has changed over the last 30, 40 years is this. It is no longer about accounting or finance. It's about driving the mission forward. How did I meet Rima? Through the digital world. Here we are. She's in our book. I was doing my thing in Maryland. So Lang asked me, how did I establish myself in this industry? It was through using digital media to power my brand. And each one of you have that opportunity. All the technology is free. Because what is happening today? Everybody is using data. Everybody is using technology. You heard people say that the technology in your hands is far more powerful than anything else. So we live in this digital world, so we have to start thinking differently. And here's what's going on with technology. Where once upon a time, when I built my first computer, because I was starting my career, I didn't have much money, a brand new computer would have cost like over $5,000. So guess what? In those days, we didn't have the internet, so I did mail order parts from all over the United States, assembled my first computer for three and a half thousand dollars, but it still was a big chunk of change. But today, you have all of this stuff literally free. Rima and I were actually sitting and we were doing LinkedIn and Twitter. It cost us nothing. We were sharing some of the thoughts that some of the speakers had shared. But that, what does it do? It creates engagement, creates relationship between people that wouldn't happen otherwise. Some of the words that I want, how did that happen? Only because people had been touched by the information that I had shared, the knowledge that I had shared. So they said, oh, Dr. Hasid is doing this. So I got votes from Australia, from Europe, all of these places. Some of the words were, I want were on global voting only happened because passionate people enjoy what I shared. And each of you can do that because if you talked about passion, whatever passion you have, you can start sharing knowledge about that passion. And you will touch tons of people and you will establish your personal brand as a result of your passion. People love 
other people with passion. It doesn't matter what it is. Now I'm going to explain cybersecurity. These are the four key concepts that you will see in cybersecurity. Cybersecurity essentially has three main goals, but then there's a sub goal about privacy, which I'm going to talk about. The first goal is that information, whether it's in somebody's head or in some digital form. Remember, information does not have to be in some digital form for us to worry about it. You see, so that's not about IT, it's not about systems. It's about information. Information in people's heads are just as important as information on a piece of paper or a digital image. And so what is necessary about that information? That some information is protected. Some information has higher levels of sensitivity. So you have to worry about the confidentiality of that information. A lot of people right now that are thinking correctly and incorrectly, what are they doing? They're talking about all these hackers coming from China and Russia. Guess what? This confidentiality concept is just as important for people within your organization. Not all people in your organization are entitled to all the information that you have in any organization. Are they? No. So we worry about that. So that is part of cybersecurity ensuring the confidentiality of information, making sure that authorized people can see it and authorized people cannot see it. The second thing, we have to worry about the truth of that information, the integrity of that information. In the era of fake news, you can see this is becoming incredibly important. Wouldn't we want to know the level of truth, any information that we read on the internet has. Do we have that today? We don't. But that is another huge opportunity for anybody. Literally anybody in this room could come up with a way to vet information that we have out on the internet that really is not true. So give it a score of fakeness or truthness or truthiness, whatever. If something is 100% on a score of truthiness, that is probably good. And then you yourself will establish a reputation. So that's another huge business opportunity. So the integrity of information is critical. Why? Because decisions are going to be made from that information. So wrong information is going to give you wrong decisions. And that's exactly what is happening. How are people getting fooled into believing something and then doing something else? This whole campaign that we had on social media with the election hacking in the United States and so on and so forth, what happened? People's minds were changed with a lot of fake information. So this is another huge opportunity. Then, the availability of information. That is another key goal because if information is not available, when you need it, or as you planned it, then what good is it? And, it? and it doesn't mean information should be available 24 by 7. So cybersecurity professionals believe that information should be planned to be available maybe Monday through Friday. Maybe you don't need it outside of Canada. So you see, you have to plan that availability. That's all part of cybersecurity strategy. A lot of people conf are confused about this concept of privacy. So let me explain privacy very simply. Think of privacy as legislated confidentiality. It is still confidentiality. It means some people shouldn't be able to see things. Other people should be able to see it. That's what privacy is. The reason you talk about privacy is because there are laws behind privacy. So I, that's why I call it legislated confidentiality. There are laws behind it, then there are penalties for when you don't comply, and there may be notification requirements when a breach actually occurs. So that's the way to think about privacy. So this model, I won't be going through the model, but the most important thing in this model is that as we do those goals of cybersecurity, 
there is a time dimension. Notice that there's a time dimension. Basically, cybersecurity is not a state. So a lot of people are equating cybersecurity and security. Don't ever do that. Security is a state. That's a 1991 concept. There's no such thing as security anymore. It's all a matter of risk management. It's all a matter of planning for certain things. Because we're in a hyper-connected world. If you were disconnected from the world for, all, for whatever information that you have, and you're never sharing anything, okay, you might have security. So don't confuse security with cybersecurity. Cybersecurity is a process. It's a continuously evolving, innovating process. And that's the most important thing that you need to understand about cybersecurity. Furthermore, think about the strategy for any organization. A healthcare organization, for, for example, is going to have a different strategy and a different need because their information is different, their clients are different than, say, an education organization or, say, a mom and pop pizza shop. They all use digital strategy, but their mission is different. So, therefore, at the bottom of that chart. So those are the contributions. So one of the things that happens when you earn a doctoral degree is you're able to contribute to the knowledge. So the most of that model was already built. I added those three things at the bottom because without mission, no strategy makes any sense. The strategy is not going to be the same, as I said, unless you understand mission. So what does the cybersecurity professional first do? They first go in and understand the mission. It doesn't matter whether you don't understand the defense industry or whatever. When you are made CEO of a company that does that business, you have to learn the business first. Then you develop your strategy around that. That is the same thing as a cybersecurity professional, because a cybersecurity professional could never develop a digital strategy for an organization without understanding the mission or the risks. So the second thing over there I added was the risk, because the risk appetite and the risk tolerance is different between different companies. So that's going to be a key determining factor. And guess what? The entire executive team has to buy in on that final risk strategy that you came up with. It has to be very conscious. Furthermore, you don't do everything one day. When I was chief information officer at a biotechnology organization, I looked at the budget, I looked at the priorities, and I developed a five-year plan. How did I do that? Based upon risk. Risk is of two types. Risk isn't always negative. There's also a positive risk, which is an opportunity. So as, when you think of a business profession, so notice that all of these things are, I'm saying, what does it have to do with IT? Nothing. Right? This is all about business, and that is why cybersecurity leadership, I have argued in my book, is that it's a, it's a business discipline. It's the discipline of the future. So, the, so you heard many speakers about before me talk about a new generation of leaders that we're going to need. You will find tons of articles that I've written on that, that we need a new breed of leaders. This breed of leaders is not going to be the same kinds of leaders that already are in power. So the only way to replace them is to replace them with a different paradigm. And I believe you can do it. Then the, so then how are you going to do this? That's where the governance comes in. Because the leadership establishes a governance framework which allows innovation to occur without having accidents. So a very simple example I'll give you. A major highway. We're all driving different cars at different speeds. But we still don't have an accident because there's a governance framework. There are some lanes, there are some rules that we have to follow, there are speed limits, etc., etc. Notice that when you have an accident is when governance, governance has failed down, broke, broken down. But that happens. We should expect some failures when you try to do innovation. No innovation ever happened without some failures. Okay? So that's the risk we are willing to take. We should be willing to take. So, I'm going to also give you an, a, a, a formal definition of cybersecurity that embraces that entire model. So when somebody asks you to explain cybersecurity, start explaining with this particular definition. That cybersecurity is not about technology, not about computer science, 
It is the mission-focused and risk-optimizing governance of information which maximizes confidentiality, integrity, and availability using a balanced mix of people, policy, and technology while perennially improving over time. So notice the three things that we also engage, people, policy, and technology. In that order, you have to have the people first. Why? Because people innovate. If you're going to choose technology to do something, and you have the wrong people or you have no people, what's going to happen? You're going to choose the wrong technology. If you buy or try to implement some technology, who's going to configure the technology correctly? People. So untrained people, unqualified people, wrong people, or no people. There are some companies that are so stupid today, they're spending billions of dollars on technology, thinking this is a technology problem, and they're never hiring the right people to do the strategy because many of these companies are being run by what are called chief financial officers. <coughs> That's something that came into the mean in about the 1980s or so. Really horrible concept. That's one, that's one executive you can get rid of from your company <laughs> and you will actually unleash an innovation revolution. Trust me, I work for chief financial officers. The thinking of a chief information officer and the thinking of a chief financial officer is radically different. They are what are called managers. They are glorified accountants. They even treat people as expenses. I've never treated people as expenses because guess where the profits of a company comes from? The profits of any company comes from the difference between the person producing whatever they produce and what I pay them. So if they produce $200,000 worth of value and I pay them 100,000, guess what? I have just made $100,000 worth of profit. However, chief financial officers do not recognize that. They are the people that single-handedly brought in this whole culture of layoffs in many companies. And they have literally eliminated job security for a lot of people. They've eliminated the reasons people used to have to stay, at least in the United States. So I've studied the United States quite a bit. I haven't studied the Canadian organizations, but I can tell you that it is the chief financial officers that started playing all those games that got rid of retirement accounts. We now have the 401k and all this other nonsense. So in other words, allegiance has declined. Innovation has declined. You're not going to innovate if your only goal is to stay in the company for two to five years or whatever and look for your next job. No. In the 30 years that I led organizations, I never had a single layoff. And as a matter of fact, I had a pre-announced no layoff policy. Why? Because I told them that, look, I don't want you to have to worry about the job. That doesn't mean I'm not going to fire you. The only reason somebody would fire somebody is for not telling the truth or not being ethical. If you were ethical, there would be no reason for you to lose a job. If you make a mistake, fine, own up to it. Because if you own up to the mistake, I know how to correct it. So, the thing about cybersecurity being as an IT profession, <coughs> guess what? We need all of these people in cybersecurity. We need lawyers, we need psychologists, we need sociologists, we need linguistics, we need writers, we need trainers, we need, it doesn't matter what your role is. If you are in any company today, trust me, you have a role in cybersecurity. Now let's talk a little bit about innovation. How are you going to do this as a leader? Somebody talked about micro-innovation, that don't try to change dramatically. That is, very, that is a very good statement because you cannot change culture in any company dramatically but you can do micro changes. And guess what? That's where most of the innovation happens. It's also very low risk. It's a simple philosophy. See, leadership is not a position, it's a state of mind. It's me deciding 
that I am going to embrace my job, my role, and be the best that I can be, and continuously learn, continuously innovate. That is what leadership is. And that is also what innovation is. So as a leader, if you can do this, you've got it made. The other thing is, we talked about diversity. Well, really, it's more about collaborative decision making from a variety of sources, variety of disciplines and ideas, so that at the end of the day, you minimize your risk and you maximize your potential the best. If you drive a company from the brain of a one person, it doesn't matter how smart you are, that company is going to be dead in the water pretty soon. But if instead you drive that organization with the brains of all the people there, you're going to be amazing. So in my case, one of the things that happened was that I was always telling people I work with people and people work with me. Nobody ever worked for me. And that's a massive difference between a leader and a manager, right? So how do you get to motivate people? First of all, remember that mission that I talked about? Make sure that the people that you hire understand the mission and tie their success to the success of that mission. They must be excited about the mission and they must be willing to live that message. Cybersecurity, because it's not a one brain sport, what do you need to do? You need to engage people at all levels, innovate at all levels, educate. So without education, this is impossible. So this is another thing that I will tell you. A lot of people worry about, oh, do I go into the field? So I, will, I run a Master of Science program in Cybersecurity Technology at the University of Maryland University College. Right now, University of Maryland University College is the world's largest cybersecurity education provider with 12,000 cybersecurity students. There is no university in the world that has that. So a lot of my graduates are asking me, okay, so I'm going through this master's program, and with all these people that are looking for experience, I said, tell them a very simple thing, that the right knowledge beats the wrong experience any time. It is much, much more important to have the right knowledge than to have the wrong experience. And guess what? If the people doing it were already doing it right, would we have the mess we have in our hands? OPM data breached. That's supposed to be United States' highest level people. Anthem, 88 million records breached. <coughs> Yahoo, over a billion records breached. I mean, what kind of nonsense is this? So the people aren't really doing it right. So how are you going to do this leadership? Ethical leadership. Ethical leadership is a very simple concept of sharing the fruits of success with the people that helped you get there. That's also the foundation of capitalism. And understand this difference between a boss and a leader. A leader nurtures, provides knowledge, and lets that person grow. But you don't want to overwater either because overwatering can also kill the plant. So cybersecurity leadership is all about this disciplinary business, ethical leadership, focusing on the mission. And now you're going to ask me, where did I learn all this? So I thought that at a women's conference, it would be most appropriate to pay homage to the person from where I learned my leadership. So I'll tell you a short story about that my mother. So that's my mother. You notice that she's dressed very well. She's looking very sharp. But also look at the wall behind that. It's really made of bamboo. And that floor, there was no floor, there was no carpet, there was no cement. It was a wooden, earthen floor. That's how she grew up. But one of the things is that she focused on what she could control. We all should focus. That's a huge example of leadership. Never worry about the things that you cannot control. You're going to drive yourself crazy doing that. But focus on the things that you can control. Every one of us have control of our, our own actions. 
So she's able to dress properly, even though she may have a few saris, few dresses, but she wore them with pride. She could make herself look pretty, groom herself properly. She didn't worry about all the other things. So she was always the best in what she did. Now, she grew up in a society and in a family where as a woman, she was not allowed to go to school. Once again, this was absolutely amazing that at five, six, whatever years of age she was, I don't even know how she even thought about this. She basically made a barter trade with her uncle who was about four years older than her and said, I want you to teach me whatever you are learning in school and then in return, I will wash your clothes, I will iron your clothes, and I will shine your shoes. Of course, the uncle who was only four years old, and this is a great deal. But that's how my mother put herself through education. But also, she said, one of the things that she is going to do is that she's not gonna get back at society, because her event essentially is raising us to be the way we are and she has empowered us. So one of the things that she made sure happened in my family is that I actually went to some of the best schools that were available to her. And she also made sure I learned English from when I was a child because she said, if you're gonna compete in the world, you will have to know English and you're gonna have to know English at a level that nobody else can ever challenge you. So I grew up to be trilingual as a result of this mother. So I'll sh show you how she imparted the values in me. In fourth grade, I was, I got a brand new teacher and the teacher was hitting the boys with a ruler like this and hitting the girls with a flat ruler. And one day my, aunt, my hand was swollen and I came home and I couldn't eat properly. My mom saw that understood the story, went back to the principal the next day, and the principal was very upset, called both the teacher and me into the office, but she first spoke to me first. She said, what is the story? So I shared my story, then she called the teacher. The teacher actually lied. The teacher said, oh, Mansoor was being naughty. Now here's the amazing thing. My mother had told me that it is not just important to be honest, it is important to have a reputation for honesty. So the principal had seen me from nursery till fourth grade. So she already knew Mansur wouldn't lie about this. So she turned to the teacher and basically said, you're fired, not because you hit him, but because you lied. So I learned very early the power of integrity and having that reputation for integrity. So that was one of the things that I've never, never, ever sacrificed. And I've taught the people that I led that integrity is not something that, oh, I can repent and I'm forgiven. No, integrity is so dear that you never give it up. The second thing is also believing in being the best in whatever role is assigned to you. So in fifth grade, what happened? Another interesting story. There was a play being organized at the school and I wanted one of the better parts, longer part, but I was denied. I was given a part, two scenes, one line to speak. So I came home crying, mom said, no, that whole play, everybody's role is important. You have to play that one role that was given to you. Now weren't there some people that didn't get any roles? I said, yeah. Well, you got a role, but there are some people that didn't get a role. You should play that role the best way possible. So I said, okay. So I did. And here's the amazing thing. There was supposed to be two awards for first place and second place in acting. But the funny thing is that I played that two scenes, that one line, apparently so well that the judges saw that this fifth grader we have to do something to encourage him. So they actually created a third prize and gave me the third prize. Once again, validation. 
So this is the way I learned leadership, and this is the way I have practiced <coughs> leadership. And you talked about culture and values. This is what I use, these are the values that I use to build a culture in my teams, as well as in the organizations that I led. And I sincerely hope that the people who are in charge of organizations embrace at least some of these values, because values are what drives culture. The reason all Canadians of a variety of colors and races and genders can actually be Canadian, or the way Americans are American, is because of the values. It is the culture that we create. That's the common ground. And I believe that if you embrace this, you will essentially change the world and lead the world. And I'm also extremely happy that Rima and Willis College actually chose to include cybersecurity leadership into their curriculum. So this is a massive opportunity for everybody in the room to actually get that cybersecurity leadership. So whatever I've said, this is now being taught. So I have developed <coughs> courses around it, entire programs around it. My master's program has woven, woven all of this in there. Willis College is the first in Canada to do this. So I recommend that you do it. Thank you very much for Willis College for having me here. Thank you for elevating Chapter National to give me this platform. And I'm sincerely honored. Thank you. We absolutely appreciate your presence. Your knowledge is incredible.